All right, uh, call the meeting of the Deerfield School Committee to order at 6.05 p.m. Uh, the first item on the agenda is review and approve the minutes from January 5th, 2022. Motion to approve. Second that. All right. All right, financial statements and warrants. Shelly. Hello. I shared out the expense reports through January 31st. I'm happy to take questions if you have them. I do have a couple things that I want to just share with you. No concerns to report. I'm not worried about the budget at this point, um, but I did want to give you an update on a few lines. So before we do that, I will just make the warrants known for the record. Um, eight warrants were signed electronically, totaling $106,782.07. Um, and then if you look at the reports, you'll notice uh, there's a significant amount left in the budget remaining um, for the year. And that is because we are still working on payroll. Brenda has been making progress, um, but that transition over into the new system takes a lot of work, um, entering individual employees, entering individual positions, entering all the funding sources. So that's still a work in progress. So the salaries are not presenting um, as they will. And my hope is that by the March meeting, we'll be a little bit closer. Uh, so that's the note there. And then there's two lines um, that I wanted to talk about that are over budget, and then I can answer any other questions that you might have if, if something comes up. But you will notice on, uh, I believe it's page five of the report under um, function code 4220 for facilities, uh, the building's general repairs line is over budget. Um, there have been some additional HVAC repairs and other things that have had to be done at the school this year that has already pushed us over. Uh, I'm not concerned about that number, you know, breaking the budget because we do have savings from other lines. For example, um, we have had some personnel changes throughout the year uh, and there's actually still a vacant position that Tina has not yet been able to fill. So um, I know she's still working on that and it might get filled, but it won't be the full salary for the year. Um, so that'll allow us to recoup where there's some overages. Uh, the other major item that I wanted to talk about is transportation, which falls on, I believe, page uh, four of the report under 3300. Uh, currently, the transportation line is not over budget, um, but we are going to see that change for two reasons. One is uh, there was a run uh, going to a particular route uh, for Eagle Brook pickup that required a larger vehicle this year because of the number of students in Deerfield from Eagle Brook on that run. And so we've had to change from a suburban, which has been used for quite some time up there, to um, a bus. And so that is coming with some additional cost. So Darius and I just negotiated with Gribco what that cost would be, and we are going to be paying an extra $71 per day. That is not budgeted, but again, I'm not concerned about being able to cover it. Uh, we will have funds from other expense lines that will be under budget. So that's the first piece. And then the second piece is the contract with Gribco has a cost of living adjustment built into it. This is the first year of, we're in year three of the contract this year. It's the first year of the contract that the COLA is coming into play. What we do is look at the CPI um, inflation rate over two years. And in prior years, it's been so low that the adjustment actually would have been a negative <laughs> COLA. Um, so we just call that a wash when that happens. But in the current year, um, we're looking at 5.9 for FY21 and uh, FY20 or I'm sorry, calendar year, because it goes January to December, um, for 20 was uh, 1.4, I believe. We're looking at a 4.5% cost of living adjustment that is owed to Gribco on the contract. Uh, and that is split amongst five schools. So, you know, Deerfield's not eating the full amount of that adjustment, but that is something that we're going to see come into play um, now that those numbers are in and we'll make the adjustments from March through the re rest of the year to make sure that they're fully paid for their contract. So those were just a couple pieces coming up. I just wanted to make you aware of, again, not concerned about the overall budget number at the end of the year at this point, um, but did want to bring that to your attention. 
and I'm happy to take other questions if you have them. I did also share with you the revolving fund balances in um, my very brief report. I'm happy to say that you know, the idea that we put in place last year, or the system we put in place last year to use ESSER funds to help cover wages for early childhood and school lunch so that we could build up reserves this year, you know, that's really working out well for us. The projected balances in those two accounts will be healthy by year end, which means that next year when that ESSER grant is no longer available, um, we can put those funds or those wages back on the revolving account. So that's good news there. Things are in good shape um, and we don't expect any major changes in those accounts going into the new year. Uh, I didn't give you projections for 23 yet on those because uh, early childhood enrollment is still happening. So we're too far out to predict there what those numbers will look like, although I don't expect they're going to change significantly. And then um, school lunch, there's a chance that it could remain universally free. That is what's being pushed right now. Uh, if that's the case and rates remain the same for reimbursement, we'll continue to be in a good spot in our school lunch program. If the USDA decides not to extend that universal free lunches, we would go back to students paying and then anyone who qualifies for free and reduced would still get free and reduced lunch. Uh, so that'll dramatically change what school lunch looks like and I imagine change also what our revenue looks like. So I'm not prepared yet. It feels too early in February to be talking about what those accounts look like, but I do feel confident that we will at least have enough reserves from this year to cover what we need to for next year's savings and be able to continue working on building that back up. So I'm happy to take questions if you have them and then we'll finish um, or continue the budget discussion later on in the agenda. Just, just a quick question on the, and I don't, I'm sorry if I am jumping ahead, but I think I just heard you talking about the transportation budget and increases that are occurring to it. Right, for the current year. Okay, because I just, a quick glance at the budget we're discussing later and the transportation is the same in, from this year to next year. So I didn't change the number for next year because we don't know what will happen with that flex vehicle for one. There could be less students. I'm not sure if those students are in sixth grade and it's going to tip the scale and, you know, that bus route could go back down. Uh, and then we also, you know, we don't typically build in for the COLA because we don't know what that's going to be. We could throw in a 3% a as a placeholder. Um, but at the same time, we're almost over inflating in a year where there isn't a COLA and we're falsifying the numbers. Um, and we typically have savings from other accounts or we could dip into school choice if we had to, to cover that over it. So I have not changed it for next year. Okay. I'm happy to do so if the committee felt like we wanted to do that to be safe, you know, we could throw in a buffer in there. It just, it's historically not what's been done. We definitely could talk about that. Yeah, okay. Any other questions on the current year? And then we can continue the 23 conversation when it comes up again. All right. Um, if there's no, Ken, I think you're on mute. Welcome, Ken. <laughs> yes. So was, my apologies for being late. Shall I just take a. a um, now I've lost track of what my question was after I muted myself so efficiently. Um, oh, the uh, there's an MOA that needs to be signed, and you just talked about a couple of things that have happened with the transportation. That MOA doesn't apply to the um, the issues you just talked about, does it? That MOA is is exactly what I'm talking about. So the $71 oh, okay. a day charge that we're going to see, the MOA is just for the current year so that there's an agreement between um, the school and the company the okay. Gerco, that we're going to pay that $71 a day for the vehicle change from the flex bus to a regular school bus. Okay. And, and again, my apologies for being late, but do you require... Did a vote get taken on that, or did you want to, to have a vote taken on it? Um, Darius, I don't know what passed. Just authorize me to sign the MOA. That the MOA. It's a, good, it's a good point. It probably should be voted on to be signed. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 
So I'd, I'd make a motion to authorize the chairman to sign uh, the MOA <coughs> with Gribco Transportation regarding the change to a bus from the flex vehicle. And Second. I can pull up the actual MOA if anyone wants to look at it quickly on the screen. I'm happy to share and, and have you just read it real quick if, if needed, but if not, that's fine. Why don't you drop it in the chat? That way they can look at it. Apologize for not having it as part of your packet. It was That's yesterday. Okay. It was yesterday's work, but yeah, I mean, I just happened to see the correspondence today on the MOA, and I was thinking it had something to do with what's been going on previously. But we've already signed that one, so um, MOA flex to bus. Should we also just? Should we throw just throw out a number that this this uh, this impacts us? It's seventy one dollars a day for the rest of the school year. Is that what you're saying? Uh, it's actually retroactively to the beginning of the school year because they made the change, and I actually Darius and I weren't even really aware of it when it happened. Um, so we're going back. So 180 days. So we're looking at twelve thousand seven hundred eighty dollars. And I just put the link to the MOA in the chat. And we're hoping it's just getting paid by um, surpluses and other parts of the budget as opposed to being taken from school choice by the end of the year? Exactly. That that'll, that'll be our first uh, step. So I've asked the accounts payable to pay it from the same general fund line, um, believing that we're going to have savings from other accounts. And if not, at the end of the year, we'll have to talk about transferring things over sure. to school choice. But I don't believe that's going to be an issue. Okay. Sounds good. So, Carrie, Carrie, you can continue to chair. I don't. I was late, so, <laughs> um, so if there's no further discussion on that, um, Ken made the motion. I second it. If we're ready to vote, um, roll call vote. Um, Ken. Yes. Carrie. Yes. David. Yes. Uh, Mary. Yes. And Erica? Yes. Uh, great. And before we move on, I realized I'd never took a vote on approving the minutes from last time. We motioned it and seconded it, and then I moved right on. So if we can backtrack, I'll take a vote on that now. Um, Ken, you weren't here. When we went over the I wrote last them. Week, which, which <laughs> Unless you amended them, I wrote them. I'm happy to vote. So. <laughs> All right. Ken, that's a yes. <laughs> uh, Carrie, yes. David? Yes. Mary? Yes. And Erica? Yes. All right. <coughs> All right. Uh, principal's report, Tina? Do you have anything for us? I have a few things. Um, right. So we just finished a week of RTI, or response to intervention and data meetings. And this is a place where we kind of discuss classroom growth. We review data and focus on stall learning or slowly progressing students, um, high achieving or low achieving. Um, and in this space, educators are able to collaborate with their grade level colleagues and strategize and brainstorm new focus areas. These meetings allow us to have a good pulse on the building to see where kids are in their learning progress and to um, focus our resources more equitably. So kudos to the, all the grade level teams for going through those meetings with us. Um, MCAS planning is in full swing. It's really hard to believe we're at that time again, but we've got our schedules drafted and um, we're eye in training and shortly students will be practicing on the practice sites. Um, and I, just a shout out to Lori Roach and Kristen Robinson for helping out with that uh, planning. And um, we finished our um, MLK school-wide events with thanks in large part to Jen Smith. Jen, can you please stand up? I'm only kidding. Uh, <laughs> so, um, we celebrated so many numerous activities that Jen was a large part of um, offering to the entire school. 
the DLT, the diversity leadership team, purchased everyone a, a picture book for a school-wide read aloud and educators, um, they read Be a King and they used a provided teacher's guide to facilitate conversation. Um, students also took part in a skin tone project where they mixed the same colors to make different skin tones. Uh, they generated art to uh, capture the different quotes from civil rights activists, uh, among many other things. So again, thanks, Jen, and the diversity leadership team. Um, on that same note, we had our second diversity after school club, and um, the theme centered around Martin Luther, Martin Luther King um, and creating a more inclusive environment here at Deerfield. Um, you know, thank you. We're so grateful to our to Lisa Gaylor, Lori Roach, Jen Smith, and Giselle Richardson for providing this rich after school option for students to continue to learn and grow while while strengthening our community. And Lori Conlin, Lori Conlin is actually leading the group. Uh, on, this is going to get a little complicated. Second grade celebrated Tuesday on Wednesday, so it was two two yes. two thousand and twenty two. So the second graders um, all had special t-shirts and they participated in twos activities like double facts and symmetry, uh, compound words. It was too much fun. Um, and today, happy 100th day. We are so excited about this. It's gonna be the 100th day again tomorrow. Thanks, Darius. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Tina. Uh, Next up is public comment. I can have you heard of any public comment? Um, I'm sorry, I was in Boston all day. I don't think I saw oh. anything from Donna come <laughs> through. We're gonna Jen Smith would like to do a public comment. Oh, oh okay. Jen, I'm sorry. Yeah. All right, then. Plus me. Um, hi everyone. I uh, I'm coming you uh, coming to you tonight to just uh, give another announcement about. Um, the second session of our community dialogue series that began back in November. Uh, we started this idea of bringing our communities together around ed the education of our young people and a greater understanding of each other. Frontier Regional School District, the town libraries and the Deerfield Inclusion Group worked together this summer to plan a community education series called Community Dialogue Coming Together Around Culturally Responsive Education. This series is going to be continuing this February 17th, and then we'll have two more sessions on March 24th and April 28th. We work together with Sapphire Dijong and Tom Chang from the Collaborative for Education, who will be facilitating the workshops. The three remaining workshops are titled, the next one coming up in February is Culturally Responsive Education, Hopes and Concerns. And then in March, digging deeper with connected conversations and ending in April with where do we go from here? We encourage people to sign up for the remaining three workshops. The idea of these workshops is to make a space for people from across the district to come together to learn how to have dialogues about our common values and to understand how culturally and historically responsive teaching can embrace all learners and teach from multiple perspectives. We're so thankful that there are so many active community members who care so much about what their students are learning and who want to understand what's happening in the classrooms. When we come together in conversation and stay open to learning about shared values and our common goals for our students, we can choose to be a stronger community for our children and for our, each other. People would need to go to the Tilton Library website where they can register for um, the Community Dialogue Series. Again, it, the second session is on February 17th, starting at 6.30 p.m. I sincerely hope you will join the conversation and alert, learn alongside other community members so you can be more informed as you make policies for our schools. Thank you for listening. Well, thanks, Jennifer. Thanks for sharing that. It's nice to know that work's being done in our community. Um, was there anyone else on the meeting who wanted to speak? Okay, seeing no one. Um, moving on to unfinished business, COVID-19 update. Um, I don't have anything real formal here. We did do a change. Uh, I guess it would be a good time to ask questions on the information that I sent out to all, to all of you regarding that change from um, following the state's change, recommended change to go from a 
um, providing at-home tests for families, um, and we stopped doing test and stay in the building, and, and it, but instead it provide additional tests. Um, we'll still be continuing to do pool testing on Mondays um, and symptomatic testing during the day, but this is kind of moving some of the responsibility off the school and putting it into families as we're kind of reaching another stage of the pandemic. So um, really, if there's any, is there questions regarding any of that, what's going on? Um, without going to clear details. I'm curious how many families you have signing up. Is it equivalent to who, who's in the pool testing? Tina? We have that number, Darius, because um, I just got asked that question. We have 262 students registered out of 311, so we're at 86%. Um, and we have 62 staff members signed up already. And that's just the first round. We're still getting, um, you know, registrations are trickling in. Great. Um, I just was wondering if you're, do you have a date already for when you're doing a second um, uh, enrollment for that or? Um, I guess that's the question. Yep. So um, if you enrolled by last Friday, the distribution is coming out next week. And I believe it's February 8th. I just sent something out. I, I'll have to double check, Erica. I'll get that to you. But I feel like it's February 8th for the next round of distribution. Yeah, I just figured it would be great to know if there was a plan already in, in place. That's great. Thank you. So basically, it's every two weeks that we have to, we have to submit on a Wednesday for the Friday order. Something of that, something of that nature. Um, and what they did, they stay staggered it to start faculty and then students, and then they're going to put the orders together eventually. Um, had to do with supply and demand. So oh, I guess I have one other sort of follow up is that in when you talked about um, how it will, uh, it. How how can you how do you see it helping? Like, what are there particular things that are that are going to be um, alleviated for the staff? Because it does seem like it's a you know it's a big responsibility for tra tracing or like how how is it helping um, flow in uh, uh, dealing with COVID at school? I'll start, and Tina, you can jump in as to the particulars of the color to the uh, deer field. But basically, right now, um, so. Where we were months ago was that, you know, we knew through contact tracing in the community and in the school where the majority, or we had pretty good confidence of where the cases were in the community. Okay. And, um, you know, I could safely come on and say like, you know, this is where we have any cases we have and so on and so forth. And we were, we, I think we were pretty accurate um, with that. Um, into December, and the state started shifting away from doing contact tracing in the community. Deerfield did get a grant to continue it, but it's not continued in the same way that it was being done, let's say back in October, um, where they're not following down with each contact and, and then tracing out. They're really putting, they're, co they're connecting with someone who is um, COVID positive and telling them to reach out to their close contacts and helping them if they need help in that area. But it's not where it was before where they were tracing out to everyone. So we've reached a point where we don't know where COVID is in the community. At the same time, we had a blow up of cases in the community um, with the Omicron you know, surge that we just, I'm, I'll say with well, Mark, I'm with that we are now, I would say we're through it based on how quickly it's dropped off. And even in the Deerfield, um, you know, we only had two cases this week compared to where we we're in double digits just a few weeks ago. Um, so the idea that, you know, we no longer are tracing that way. Um, also, we were doing test and stay. And of the test and stay, when we did the last report of it, we did 1,131 tests and only found four positive cases. And so it just was showing that statistically it was not an effective screening mechanism. Um, and we also, statistically, the number of close contacts that became infected was, was extremely low as well. So we weren't even, by finding close contacts in, the, in school and in classrooms and such, just wasn't proving to be anything but really telling people to be vigilant, and then not be vigilant. And we were not seeing that that was actually providing. By being able to give tests midweek, um, the second test now available, and Desi actually just came out yesterday and said, oh, please use that. You can also tell families, and we're gonna have to get this information out, um, 
If you're not feeling well, use the test. You don't have to wait for the testing day that you signed up for. So we're going to have to educate families on it. The problem is there's so much information, and I think families are saturated. And it's probably some of you may feel the same way um, with this. So it's kind of that's why I think some of the sign up isn't like if people really understood. We're just asking you to sign up so we can give you tests to send home so that you can use them. You know what I mean? When you, you know when you see fit, I think people you know are. We've been sending so much information about COVID over and over. I think people are, you know, so we're going to have to probably do it a few times to get people to understand, um, you know, what we're trying to do. I think, you know, it's setting the stage for the off ramp or the um, endemic game that will be you'll be going towards soon. Um, I think you'll see um, as these numbers come down, the numbers are also going to come down because the amount of cases that are out there that aren't being reported are also coming down. I'm not going to be you know, faking the statistics there in the sense that if you're, you know, right now, if you aren't feeling well and you do a test at home, you as an adult and not affiliated with the school and you have a positive, you're not telling anybody, you know, especially if you're um, not feeling, you know, you know, many people are vaccinated, they're having mild symptoms. Um, and so if you're not, you know, if you're feeling, you know, you just got a runny nose and a slight cough and a couple of days later you feel well, you're not checking in with a doctor and, or, or having things that are putting your data into Maven which is the, the software that's tracking the amount of cases across the state. So we're going to see that, that number drop even lower because it's becoming an endemic, which is basically a normalization of, um, of a disease that is kind of normalized within society. It's not a, a spike or out of control. So that will allow us to at some point talk about, you know, where we, how do we change our policies? You know, people are, are you know, the questions out there. Well, when are masks coming off? And that will happen in stages as well in the spring. And you guys obviously have a hand in that since we have a policy on masks. Um, but, you know, families having more control of, you know, if they are positive and being able to track it themselves is going to be a big factor in that. Um, additionally, we've had quite a few cases overall, and that brings that number down too. So, um, okay. So anyway, we hope that that's the trajectory of this and that we can say that there is a uh, normalization. I don't think, like you say, COVID is not going to go away. It'll be that one of those flus that will continue around for a while, but it won't be something that paralyzes the school as this once did. That's the hope anyway. Not going to work. Other questions on this? Anything, anything I'm, just, I'm just curious. I don't want to take a huge amount of time and raise a, a huge issue, but I'm just curious what the uh, discussion is about vaccine uh, mandates for schools and um, whether you've heard of any of that in your sort of superintendent circles around the state, whether any cities or municipalities are doing that. So the for students and staff? For kids, kids to go to school in the district, just like we have other requirements. So, I mean, that would have to come. So there are districts that started talking that way um, and then ran into real legal problems very quickly because there are mandated vaccines that are required by the state. You know, if the state wants this vaccine to be required, then they should go through the process they did, you know, other vaccines that are required to attend school. And so I think the school districts that started going that route and having conversations at school committee about doing that, um, started getting legal advice that they would not win in legal battle because of the other, um, because of how the other vaccines that are mandated are treated. Um, there are some districts that did require staff to get vaccinated um, and put in, and then put in obstacles for the staff. Not as as hard uh, aligned as you know you've seen some of the like you know a state police or something where you were fired, um, but putting in you know obstacles to have them to test on their own at weekly and doing some other things in that. I haven't I have no real interest in going that route. Um, one, we have such a high level of vaccination rate, and two, um, I think you know that we've seen the last surge. It's not it's not as selective, um, although it's. The question is, how far do you overstep on as an employer to say this is what you need to do to stay healthy? I mean, I think everybody should be vaccinated. Um, I mean, statistically, it shows that that's a beneficial thing. But, you know, I didn't think that was a battle that we needed to take on in the middle of it, given that it was such a low number of our faculty and staff that were vaccinated. So, um, so it sounds like you're saying it's, there is no sort of hodgepodge district by district movement that if it comes, it's going to be coming from the state wide. Based on the um, yeah, I don't know. If, I don't know of any district that has done any requirement of vaccination. Um, certainly not in Western Mass. Um, and then you know the we you know there was also 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, can't, I can't think of any that have done it. So um, yeah. it'll be interesting to it'll be interesting to see what the off ramp they call it, you know months ago they were calling it the off ramp of what the removal of masks and that kind of thing did. You know, because they, they were talking about eighty percent vaccination rates. They're not going to get that statewide. Yeah. So I think you're going to see a, a change of course on policy on that. Um, I don't think we're we're close to eighty percent um, in many of our buildings. That, I don't think we are close to 80% in many of our buildings. Um, maybe that will change, but maybe it won't. Um, but so I think you're going to see a new kind of rollout um, because they're just not going to get that. And they're especially not going to get it in the larger urban districts where their vaccination rates are far lower. Um, and then I have worries about it, about creating segregation in your own building if you're going to require those who aren't vaccinated to wear masks and how's that going to be policed and that's not very healthy for children at all. And you, you really got to, have to show the evidence that for, for children that, 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 that those vaccinations are, are making a huge difference. I mean, it certainly makes a huge difference. Um, I think certainly in the elderly and those who are vulnerable, but I, I haven't seen that in my own research and that kind of thing, seen it making a huge difference among um, kids, but maybe it is. And, you know, as the surge went through, we haven't had many, um, compli- you know, kids who had complicated issues. Maybe it's because they were vaccinated. You know, it's hard to correlate. I'll let the experts do that. Thanks. All right. So, um, Darius, was, was there anything else with the COVID updates? Or did you cover it? We've got the side they, covered it. they did postpone tomorrow's vaccination clinic. Um, mm-hmm. So, please see the push out information for those details because I don't have it in front of me. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have the capital improvement plan update. Uh, um, yes, I don't have any, I don't have any new information. I don't imagine Darius, you do either. Um, we haven't met the capital planning committee has not met. So we haven't had the chance to discuss, um, discuss the topics that we're, you know, we've sort of had on the back burner. So as soon as we've met, I will provide an update. <clears throat> All right. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Next up, new business. We got the fiscal year 23 budget proposal discussion. Welcome back. I'm just going to share my screen. So this is just a reminder here of what the first draft uh, came in at when we met last month. We were looking at a 5.23% increase, uh, which did include some new initiatives. There was a new faculty position. Uh, There was an increase for OT, which is an existing position, but bringing that up to full time. Uh, We also had, um, what other new things were on here? The part-time nurse position, we were moving up to full time. And then the other pieces were things that were just being rolled into the budget because of existing expenses. The technology piece was not new initiatives. Um, We're just looking to properly fund and fully fund existing um, contracts that we already have for software and network support. Um, And then the employee separation costs as well were in there. So uh, we had talked about what the possible increase or decreases could be. Um, Tina and Darius and I met and did make some changes. So in the new draft, Uh, We are looking at a 3.09% increase currently. Um, The steps that we took to get there was just the elimination of those new initiatives. So we moved the full-time faculty position, um, decreased the OT back to the 0.4 FTE from the 1 FTE, and we reduced the LPN back to part-time. The LPN was a decision that actually came up like right the day that we were meeting and I hadn't pulled that out yet. So that piece is something that is not um, at the moment very impactful to the school. We will have the full-time nurse and then um, one part-time position as well. But the other two pieces, you know, the the need is still there for that additional faculty position that Tina talked about last time, as well as the additional OT support. But we understand that there has to be some changes um, in in order to bring the budget down. This is what we started with for reductions. Um, Any questions about that decision or those decisions? (coughs) 
Okay, so I guess at this point, um, what we're looking at is some direction from the committee as far as the next steps in this decision making process of where we go with the budget. And we have time. There doesn't have to be decisions made tonight. Um, I Deerfield, I don't believe Darius has requested that we present to them, right? Their finance committee and select board is not asking for that. So we imagine they'll come to our public hearing as they usually do. Uh, right. which I believe will be with the March meeting. Um, yes, I believe we have a member listening in, Julie. I, Julie Shelfond is on this evening, I think, I see. Great. She had inquired, so. Um, so anyways, typically the that. way that it works is at the March meeting, we would have the public hearing first, and then we would go into the school committee meeting and discuss or vote on the budget if we were ready to move it through without any changes. Uh, so if we want to be prepared for that same timeline in March, uh, we need some guidance on where we want the number to go. So do we go in with a 3.09% increase as we presented here, which is essentially level service for everything else? Um, and then those changes that I mentioned above, which again are not new initiatives, um, just things that we need to fully fund in the budget that haven't been fully funded in previous years. Um, or do we start talking about additional ways to reduce the budget? So, um, you know, I'm happy to throw some ideas out there based on what Darius and Tina and I have talked about, um, but would love to hear from all of you where you're thinking that target number should be. Um, I'll just ch chime in if I could. So, um, I mean, I, I don't see any problem with this 3% as being a, a good place uh, to be. Um, but are we moving? Can we talk about priorities? Is this a good place to talk about that? I know we seem to have stopped before we got to this um, subheader called further points of discussion. Yeah, I mean, we can definitely get into those pieces uh, okay. and talk about what the options are if we were to continue to reduce. So there are some uh, discussion points that Tina and Darius and I talked about. Uh, so, the first, oh, go ahead. Um, okay, so I just wanted, well, I don't know that it's necessarily. Um, Reducing, I think it's a maybe a question of, if I'm reading this correctly, a question about priorities. And of course, priorities are where we lean on administration to tell us what priorities are. But it seems like an obvious one. I shouldn't say obvious because I may be totally wrong. But um, you know, there there was you know there's a, clearly was an express need for this um, new faculty position and instructional coaching position that was discussed, and there was a need for that, and that's sort of gone away but then you, somebody is clearly raising the issue of three teachers teaching 40 kids in grade four and so i'm just wondering um is that is is there somebody within the school who has the skills that that we would be looking for in that new instructional coaching position um or would that if we did lose a classroom uh, would we not be reshuffling people? But we'd actually be maybe losing a, um, a teacher and hiring a different kind of teacher with different skills, because that seems to be a budget, presumably somewhere in a budget neutral area, but would be a question about priorities. Yeah, that, that's a great question. And I'd love Tina to talk to that. As far as the um, losing someone, you know, if we were to make this change of actually reducing a teacher and eliminating a position without throwing in exactly what you're saying, David, and just kind of moving things around. Um, there is a placeholder in there for a teacher who retired. So we're not actually eliminating any staff members. I just want to make that known that there is a vacant position that's in as a placeholder. You know, I think that's important as we have part of this conversation that we're not talking about somebody losing their job if we were to make any of these shifts. Um, and then I will certainly let Tina talk about the piece, uh, your other question there. And I just had to jump in. Tina has to be, uh, when you ask questions about, is there anybody qualified to move around and such, that kind of thing, it's, that can be, it's kind of close to that you know, employee confidentiality and hiring processes and that kind of stuff. So I'm telling, I'm sending the stage for you, Tina, because I know you you kind of give that look like. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. All I was going to say is that if the way that it looks that no one would lose their position when we exactly what Shelly said. Shelly answered it the way I would. I mean, and don't forget, we have two sixth grade sections right now, and we were going to, we have to move ahead with a third grade se section because, I mean, a third sixth grade section. So there is going to be some shuffling, anyways. 
that was that was the piece. We wouldn't have to bring on a new sixth grade teacher. We would be doing some shuffling. Okay. <clears throat> so, hold on. Can I? I'm sorry. Yep, just go ahead, Dan. Just to clarify, this is a good mental exercise here. So, are you saying? Um, I, I think I lost that. So, when you talk about reducing classroom sections from three to two in grade four, is that part of like one teacher, so you get down, you've got three, presumably three teachers going down to two. Are you saying that that opens up one teacher to take a third, sixth grade section? Or are you saying you've already got a open slot from somebody retiring to, to be the third, sixth grade teacher? The first thing that you were talking about. So if um, we would have to go ahead and hire a, another teacher for sixth grade because we have that bubble year. There's two classroom teachers there. Um, and we need to have three the following year. So if we consolidated, we would do a shuffle. We wouldn't have to um, hire another teacher for that position. We wouldn't need an additional faculty position. I think she that's what Shelly's talking about with the place saver in the budget. It, was that clear? Um, just, uh, no? <laughs> not really, no. So for we're, next we're, we're graduating a two section sixth grade. Right. So it's out. So now the overall mass of number of three section classes is going up because of the younger grade is coming in with three sections. So this, by reducing this section, we in a sense would be able to shift people around because so, we, so, by we're graduating one two section class, we're going to be creating another two section class in the fourth grade. That so it's sense? not a budget, it's not a saving money to go from three to two fourth grade classes. No, it is. I, Tina, I think we've already counted for that third sixth grade class. So if we were if we were to make this shift, and actually we'd actually be eliminating a, a faculty position, and you'd still have the appropriate number of grade level teachers. Yes, but I, I, if I'm hearing it correctly, that faculty position we're eliminating is not presently filled, correct? It's just a placeholder. Yes. Okay. I don't know if that helps you, David, or not, but <clears throat> our, our physical staffing does not, from this year, does not change going into next year but we are in essence eliminating a position because we've been ha we've had a placeholder in place, right? I guess to rephrase it, um, at three percent, and you put this further point of discussion thing, is it budget neutral to drop from four from three fourth grade classes and then have a slot to hire this? this new instructional coaching position, which you have eliminated to get right. to 3%. Yes. That's why I'm talking about priorities. Mm -hmm. so, so that's budget neutral? Correct. Okay. So what is the calculus then on whether or not to reduce three fourth grade classes to two or not? Are and not hire the, a, a new teacher? But the new position? You, you said you, I thought you said you eliminated the instructional coaching position to get to to um, the new 3%. Changes from the first draft, eliminated additional yeah. faculty position, right? Correct. Okay. So if that was a priority, it seems like it's revenue, it's budget neutral to actually hire that person and not have three fourth grade classrooms. Mm -hmm. That is correct. Right. If the committee is comfortable with the number at 3.09 percent. Right. Okay. Correct. But, okay. But, and, and then is the committee getting involved in that discussion of the priorities of the building um, between the instructional coaching position and three fourth grade classrooms? Or will you make, you have you already decided or would you make that decision without our input? Uh, it's a, that's an excellent question. So, 
we're talking about where, where, where the school committee's role comes within. So the educational decisions should be made by the administration. However, you hold the funding sources to those decisions. So you essentially, you play a hand in it because you you allow funding for those decisions to be made. You're saying, so we have to tell you what we're spending money on. You can say, let's say it came down between a choice of two things. You could say, you know, we're going to leave that up to the administration. We're going to need to fund the one faculty. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And then you guys can determine, you know, I mean, we're kind of looking at something similar to that in Sunderland because we don't know class sizes in the undergrades yet because we're waiting on enrollment changes to occur. So there's kind of like, you know, there's some of that kind of like you understanding where your numbers are in the budget, but we're going to leave that decision to you. But when it goes to single positions and single increases, then you do have, it turns into a role where you have a decision-making factor, but we don't just say new faculty member mm -hmm. and you guys go, well, we trust you. We don't really know, care what it's for. We just trust you need another one. But so instead we have to say what it's for. So that you, does that make sense? I, I guess so. I guess probably the committee is interested in hearing um, what the priority is. Can I jump in? Um, just it's related to this too. Uh, and I guess it's a bit of um, my own need for clarification. The eliminated additional faculty position is what it is that it is the proposed um is it a is it a teaching position or was it the the sort of i remember you talking last time about a particular new um like inner i'm sorry i'm not going to get the terminology right but there was a special position you were trying to create it sounded like is that what's being eliminated or is it actually related specifically to this classroom shuffle quote unquote so that's i that that's something i'm wondering if they're actually are we talking about parallel that is is this are they related are they is it a cause and effect there um because yeah my general question would be about looking at the the grade four and and its needs as well in terms of can it go down to two you know, is is it going is going down to two classrooms going to be, um, uh, you know, what's that going to how's that going to squeeze that learning experience? Um, so that's another extra layer of it. But I think the first question I wanted to know is just how does that additional faculty position or does that additional faculty position position that's being eliminated uh, um, relate to the reduction of the classroom sections in grade four or the addition of the um, the need to to, to have a, a third sixth grade class. So Hoping let me try to sense. present it a different way. So <laughs> FY22 budget had 22 grade level positions okay. to cover all of the classroom needs. FY23, we added in this new position Okay. So let's say that makes it 23 in the first graph. We pulled out that 23rd because financially it's difficult to fund another full-time teaching position. So the current draft at 3.09% has 22 grade level positions, same as this year. Okay. One of those is vacant from a retirement. We only need if we reduce to two sections in grade four, 21 grade level teachers. So what David is saying, essentially, if we wanted to go in at 3.09%, that vacant position could be reallocated to fund the new position that Tina talked about as a priority in the first draft. And it wouldn't decrease the budget from 3.09, it also wouldn't increase us back up. So we could get that new position if we were to keep in the vacant teacher position. The other option is to eliminate that position to further reduce the budget, and we do not also get the new position that we talked about in the first draft. Okay, so yeah. it does not affect, it has nothing Am I re reading this that it does nothing to do with needing to add the sixth grade class or reducing 
and balancing no, it by reducing the fourth grade. The extra sixth grade class is already accounted for okay. in the 21 grade level positions that we have in the budget. Okay. And I also want to note that, so as we are developing this budget, Tina has also been working with her people. And I think, Tina, you want to jump in? You, there is, we're looking at the, the students' needs. Um, and as we start to reconfigure some of these classrooms and this kind of stuff, there, I'm thinking, um, in my last conversation I had with Tina was talking about possibly not going for that position and looking at other types of supports, like additional instructional assistance support to deal with some of the um, uh, issues they're having in the lower grades. And so, to you, I, to you, you're nodding. I should let you speak there. I was going to answer David's question around priorities. Priorities would probably be smaller class sizes and then um, having some additional IA support. So, Jerry's you were spot on. Um, after having conversations with faculty and staff and, and hearing their input um, and seeing some of the needs, we have some students coming in from early intervention, too, that we're going to be receiving that um, will look like we'll possibly need some support as well. But, but is, if that's true, then you would, you would be really um, prioritizing certain grades for the, for the smaller class sizes because of the needs, right? The needs, I mean, you, you get needs come in different uh, cohorts of kids. So, okay, yeah. I mean, I'm all for supporting that analysis of, of where the, the needs are. And, and I have no qualms supporting movements when, if, if the, in other words, if, if the people moving into fourth grade need a lot of supports, then then wonderful. They'll have 13, 14 kids in a classroom, and I suppose generally that's better. But if that's not the grade that is needing the resources, then maybe we should then to fourth grades and, and moving some resources to the other grades, as you say, with additional IAs or whatever would be the way to go. And, the big picture is it seems to me that at 3.09 you've got some additional resources to play with to drill down on where the support mm -hmm. needs are. I guess right. and, and Danny, we did have that exact conversation you're talking about. And because you're looking at if you look at some of the lower grades, some of their enrollments are actually similar to grade four. But we want to keep we want to keep those grades smaller to get the individual attention, especially for the learning, you know. The pandemic impact, I don't want to call it learning loss, but the pandemic impact it's had, especially on younger kids, um, you know, in crucial areas of, you know, pre-K, I mean, K in, in first grade, um, pre-K, K in first grade. And so we, we actually made a conscious decision to say, okay, what, looking at the older grades, you know, the kids can do, they can do well in, in looking at the kids who are in the class with a slightly larger class. In fact, socially, it can also be beneficial. You start getting class sizes, you know, very low teens, a couple of kids are absent, you start having some some uh, interesting social dynamics in classes that small when those kids are ready socially to go bigger. So um, yeah, we did look at that and we probably should explain all that when we... No, that's actually great to hear because I was also kind of leaning with the idea that, well, if you increase the size of a class, wouldn't you want more uh, support for the teacher to navigate? But uh, what you're saying about the and, and, and having to sort of wrap my head around the fact that the older kids are the fourth, fifth, and sixth grades and that the younger kids are the younger ones than that. That makes a lot of sense um, how you're, you know, you're explaining that. So I appreciate that clarification or exposure, exposition. Um, yeah, in hindsight, we could have drawn this up a little bit. <laughs> well, I mean, just, I think we just kind of, we missed kind of early on and it got confusing. Well, I also, also, think there's the question of um, do we know uh, if we're going to see any kind of return in enrollment next year uh, now that we've been back we will have been back a full year in 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 person instruction um, you know and we we know we lost students last year um, to whatever our enrollments were down. Our enrollments have remained down to a, a degree this year. And my concern would be making the jump right now or making the decision right now um, with that fourth grade class. If we pick up 
six or eight students. Now, all of a sudden, you're at 23, 24, 25 kids in the classroom section, which is pushing the limits of where we've always wanted to not be. So I think if we have another month at 3.09% to sit and, and really talk this through further, Tina and Darius and, you know, the rest of the team and Shelly, um, it will it will give a clearer picture. It might be that we, you know, go with two sections and maybe as David was saying, bring in that that position you were hoping, the coaching position that you were hoping to hire. Or it might be that we uh, go with two sections and bring in the additional IA support. Um, or it might be that we just take the take the step of eliminating the position and, and coming in with the, the lower request. So um, personally, I think staying at the 3.09% for, you know, into March and really have the discussion at the uh, public hearing in March, we're going to be in a good place. Uh, so I don't know how everybody will know what other people think, but that's my thoughts. <clears throat> yeah, I agree with you. Ken, I'm I'm okay with saying it's 3.09, and uh, it's been a lot of interesting conversation. But my takeaway is kind of I feel like it's really a, a the school's decision what happens with those positions. It's I don't as a committee I don't I don't want to be dictating what what the best needs of the school are. It should be like a building building decision. Yeah, similarly, I would just want to you know make figure out the best way to keep keep the staffing at the levels that are needed for the students. Um, so, you know, what we can do to support that. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to start. I, I don't, I also don't feel ready to try. <laughs> I don't think I would want to, even if it was time to do it, um, to try to reduce uh, the number of, of, of teachers. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm good with, um, especially if we have more, a little more time to think about it. Yeah, and I appreciate the, that direction moving forward. Um, I, I do, you know, we try to approach this budget with, and we try, we've done this across in the other schools as well, is just trying to show transparency of where we're thinking about you know, moving things around. And sometimes transparency, that kind of level, you know, where we show we have draft one, where we have dreams and, and other ideas, and then we cut those things can go both ways. You know, it can go one way, where, oh, well, we need to get you that. And the other side is like, well, why did you show it to us if you didn't? You're not, if you're not fighting for it at this point, you know what I mean? And so I think we're, you know, Shelly and I are worrying, now I'm not worried, we're working on trying to, what level of transparency we just showed so you can see where we're thinking instead of coming, because we could come in with a very more polished kind of finished product, but we want the community to have a hand in seeing what's going on and because it kind of gives you an idea of what we're thinking. So I guess we've got to kind of, you know, obviously this conversation tonight, we have to iron some of that stuff out, but um, that was the idea is to show well, transparency as we move stuff around. And I also think an additional month will give us a better feel for where the, maybe a better feel for where the town is headed. I don't know where Julie, if Julie wants to say anything, but $152,000 is, is a good portion of anything that I'm reasonably confident would be a good portion of anything that the finance committee is you know contemplating for an increase in the, at the town level so um or you know an ability so it it just gives us that one more month to look at things from all perspectives <clears throat> any further thoughts or questions on the budget Right. If they're done, we um, can move on to reports. Uh, committee Chair Ken, do you have? A I have nothing. All right. Collaborative, Erica. I just have a couple of notes. Um, we didn't. We we met um, on the twenty sixth, and I do not believe I re we received a you know a summary is that we usually get. So I just figured I'd say that uh, just two two points that that came up. Um, where that there was an election, there was a space open on the executive committee, and Irv Rhodes was elected to that position. After there were actually two people who were vying for that position, and um, 
So there was a, 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 a vote for that. Um, and also we heard from Emily Hoffman from the Massachusetts Migrant Education Program. And um, you know, one of the things that I kind of have really liked is that we get to hear uh, about different programs that CES is, is uh, sponsoring or working with people in the community. And so this was kind of a, um, a real, um, really informative uh, presentation on, on uh, kids in um, migrant families and or migrants and mi migratory workers themselves and uh, how they're being supported in the school systems uh, in the state. So um, really enjoyed learning about that. So that's really the main main points. But when the um, report comes out, I will certainly forward it along to people. That's it. Thanks, Erica. Um, the hearing uh, reports and updates on what the collaborative is doing was one of my favorite points of being on the collaborative board. So yeah. glad you're getting to hear it. <laughs> All That's right. Nice. Uh, superintendent's report. I don't have one. Okay. That's easy. All right. Um, is there any need for executive session? I'm. So if people want an update on negotiations, we could go to executive session to do that and now return to open session. If you want the update of where we're at, or can you just leave? Um, I think I'm accidentally. It's <laughs> like no, not me. Um, but if you want, we can do that. We can do a. We could. I could quickly just send you out a link to do that if you want an update there. Or if you don't, then we can update you later. I'll go with an update later, unless there's something very pressing that's going to happen in the next month. No, our next meeting is not until March third. I defer to the chairwoman who is running this meeting. Um, I feel, I have, as a member of the negotiating committee, I feel like I know the details, so I don't need an update. I'm I'm okay. I think we can wait. There's nothing going to happen in the next month anyway. So wait until we have more news, and then we'll share it. That sounds all right with everyone. All right. Um, and we yeah, have reached the end. Would, um, I didn't catch that, Erica. Um, I would take a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All right. Roll call. Uh, Ken has not returned. Uh, Carrie Etchell's yes. David? Yes. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Mary? Yes. And Erica? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, adjourned at 7.07 p.m. <laughs>